The Teogonia of Isiodos by Audiobooks Dimension. Let us begin to sing of the Muses of Aelagorn, who hold the great and holy mound of Aelagorn, and dance on tender feet round the violet spring and the altar of Chrono's mighty son. Having washed a soft skin in Permissus Spring, or Ipocrini, or Holy Omeos, on Eligorn's summit, they lead the fair and beautiful dances with rapid steps. Setting out from there, concealed by air, they walk at night, chanting their fair song, singing of Zeph's Ageochos and Mistress Era of Argos, who walks in golden sandals, and Zeph's Ageochos' daughter, Oide Arphony, and Fordus Apollon and Archerus Artemis, and Poseidon at Elbrisa, Earthshaker, and revered Themis and glancing Aphrodite, and gold-crowned Evie, and lovely Dione, Litho, Eopatas, and crafty Kronos, Eos, great Eos, and bright Selene, Yea, great Okinos, and black Nyx, and the holy race of other immortals who always are. Once they taught Azi Odo's beautiful song, as he watched his sheep under holy Elegorn. This is the first thing the goddesses told me. The Olympian Muses, daughters of Zeph's Aegeochos. Rustic shepherds, evil oaks, nothing but bellies. We know how to say many lies, as if they were true. And when we want, we know how to speak the truth. This is what the prompt voice daughters of Ritzeth said. They picked and gave me a staff, a branch of strong moral, a fine one, and breathed into me a voice divine, to celebrate what will be and what was. They told me to sing the rays of the blessed, who always are, but always to sing of themselves first, and also last. But what is this about all rocks me? Isiodos, let us start from the Muses, who with singing cheer the great mind of Father Zeph's in Olympos, telling things that are, and will be, and were before. With harmonized voice, the unbroken song flows sweet from their lips. The Father's house rejoices, the house of loud-sounding Zeph's, as the delicate voice of the goddesses spreads, the peaks of snowy Olympus echo, and the homes of the immortals. With ambrosial voice, they praise in song, first, the august race of gods from the beginning, whom Yea and Waidu and those begot, and those born from them, the gods, givers of good, and second, of Zeps, the father of gods and men, the goddesses sing, beginning and ending the song, how he is best of gods and greatest in power. Next singing of the race of men and mighty gigantes. They cheer the mind of Zeph's in Olympus, themselves, the Muses of Olympus, daughters of Zeph's Aegeochos. Manny Mosini, who rules the hills Ayla Theatre, having lain with the father, Chrono's son, in Pieria, bore them to be a forgetting of evils and a respite from cares. For why Zeph lay with her, nine nights apart from the immortals, going up to the holy bed. But when a year went by, and the season turned round. As moons waned, and many days were completed, she bore nine like-minded daughters, in whose breasts and spirit song is the only care, just below the summit of snowy Olympus. There are their polished dance floors and lovely houses. Next to them, the Carites and Imeros have homes in joy. Chanting from their lips a sweet song, they sing, and praise the customs and noble ways of all the immortals, chanting a most sweet song. Then they went to Olympus, wrapped in the lovely air, the ambrosial song, the black earth echoed round to their singing, and a sweet beat arose under their feet as they went to their father. He was ruling the sky, holding the thunder and fiery lightning bolt himself. Having conquered Father Kronos by might, in right detail, he dealt laws and appointed honors to the immortals. These things the Moses sang, who hold Olympian homes, nine daughters begotten by great Zeph's. Cleo, FDP, Thalia, and Melpomene, Tepsicori, Erato, Polinia, Arania, and Galope, who is most eminent of all, for she is companion of reverent kings. Whomever of kings, favored by Zeps, the daughter of great Zeps honor and see being born, they pour sweet dew on his tongue, and from his lips flow honeyed words, his people all to him, as he decides issues with straight judgments. Speaking unerringly, he quickly and wisely ends even great strife. This is why there are sensible kings, since they secure restitution for the Rongian public, and easily, persuading by soft words, going to assembly. They pray to him as to a god, 
with supplicant awe. In assembly, he is preeminent. Such is the holy gift of the Moses to men. Bore from the Moses and far shooting Apollon, are men on earth who sing and play the harp. But kings are from Zeps. He prospers, whom the Moses love. A sweet voice flows from his lips. For if one has grief in his newly vexed spirit, and his heart is withered in sorrow, and then a bard, the Moses servant, sings the fame of former men and the blessed gods who hold Olympus. Soon he forgets his mind's burden and remembers none of his cares. Quickly, the goddess's gifts divert him. Greetings, children of Zeps. Grant me lovely song, and praise the holy race of immortals who always are, who were born from Yea and Starry Renos, and from Darknix, and those salty Pontus raised. Tell how at first gods and earth came to be, and rivers and vast sea, violent in search, and shining stars and the wide sky buff, and the gods born from them, givers of good. How they divided their wealth and allotted honors, and how first they held their own pose. Tell me these things, Musa with Olympian homes, from the first, say which of them first came to be. First of all, Karas came into being, but next, wide-breasted Yea, always say foundation of all immortals who possess the peaks of snowy Olympos, and dim Tartaros in a recess of the white parted earth, and Eros, most beautiful among the immortal gods, Lim Weakener, who conquers the mind and sensible thought in the breasts of all gods and all men. From Koros were born Erevas and Black Nyx. From Nyx were born Athe and Amera, whom she conceived and bore, joined in love with Erevas. Ye first bore a child equal to herself, Stary Urenos, to cover her all over, and to be an all safe home for the blessed gods. She bore the high Uria, pleasing homes of divine nymphies, who dwell in the veiled mountains. She also bore the barren sea, violent in search, hunters, without love's union, but next she lay with Urenos and bore deep walling Okinos, and Keos, and Creos, and Iperion, and Iarpatos, and Thea, and Rhea, and Themis, and Manimosini, and gold crowned Foyvi, and attractive Tethys. After them was born the youngest, crafty Kronos, most terrible of children. He hated his lusting father. Next, she bore the Kiklopace with an overproud heart. Rondis, and Sterope, and hard-hearted Argus, who gave Zeph's thunder and made the lightning bolt. They were like the gods in everything else. But a single eye was in the middle of their foreheads. They were given the name Kiklopace because one round eye was in their foreheads. Strength, force, and skill were in their works. Next, others were born from Ye and Urenos, three great and mighty sons, unspeakable Carters, and three Areos, and Yes, Rash children. From their shoulders shot a hundred arms unimaginable, and fifty heads on the shoulders of each grew over their strong bodies. Great and mighty strength was in their huge shape. For all who were born from Ye and Urenos were the most terrible of children, and their father hated them from the first. When any of them first would be born, he would hide them all away, and not let them come up to the light. In a dark hole of Yea, the evil deed pleased Urenos. But she, vast Yea, groaned within from the strain, and planned an evil crafty trick. Quick, she made the element of grey adamant, made a great sickle, and advised her sons, speaking encouragingly, while hurt in her heart. Children of me, and wicked father, if you are willing to obey, we may punish the evil outrage of your father, since he first planned unseemly deeds. She said this, but fear seized them all, and none of them spoke. But great and crafty Kronos was brave, and quickly gave an answer to his dear mother. Mother, I would undertake and do this task, since I have no respect for our father unspeakable, since he first planned unseemly deeds. He spoke, and Vastier was greatly pleased in her mind. She placed and hid him in ambush, and put in his hands a sickle with Jagjadith, and revealed the whole trick. Great Uranos came, bringing on night, and upon Yea he lay, wanting love and fully extended. His son, from ambush, reached out with his left hand, and with his right hand took the huge sickle, along with Jagjadith, and quickly severed his own father's genitals and threw them to fall behind. 
they did not fall from his hand without result. For all the bloody drops which spurted were received by Yaya. As the year revolved, she bore the strong Irinias and great Igandes, shining in armor, holding long spears in their hands, and the Nymphes called Melee on the endless earth. As soon as he cut off the genitals with edament, he threw them from land into the turbulent sea. They were carried over the sea a long time, and white foam arose from the immortal flesh. Within, a girl grew. First, she came to Holy Kithira, and next, she came to wave-washed Kipros. An awesome and beautiful goddess emerged, and grass grew under her supple feet. Aphrodite, foam-born goddess, and well-crowned Kitharia, guards and men name her. Since in foam she grew, and Kitharia, since she landed at Kithira, and Kiprianus, since she was born in wave-beat Kipros, and Philomedes, since she appeared from the genitals. Heroes accompanied her, and fair Emeras followed, when first she was born and went to join the guards. She has such honor from the first, and this is her province among men and immortal guards. Girls whispers, and smiles, and deceptions, sweet pleasure, and sexual love, and tenderness. Great Uranus, their father, called his sons Titanes, reproaching the sons whom he himself begot. He said they strained in wickedness to do a great wrong, but there would be revenge afterwards. Nyx bore hateful Moros and Black Keel and Thanatus. She bore Ipnos in the tribe of Omeros. Next, Momos and painful Oises were born to the dark goddess Nyx, though she there with no one, and the Esperides who keep beyond famous Okinos, the beautiful gold apples and the fruit-bearing trees and she bore the Mirae and pitiless gears, Clotho and Lachesis and Artropos, who give to mortals at birth both good and evil to have, who pursue the sins of men and gods. The goddesses never end their terrible anchor until they inflict evil on anyone who sins. And deadly Nyx bore Namison, a plague to mortal men. After her, she bore a party and Philetus and painful Eurus and hard-hearted Ares. And hateful Ares bore painful Ponos, Lethe and Lemos, and the tearful Alger, Ismene, Marche, Ponus, and Androcosia, Nike, Psevdes, Logi, and Amphilage, Dysnomia and Arti, near one another, and Augus, who most afflicts men on earth, when anyone willingly swears a false oath. Pontus begot Neurus, truthful and never false, eldest of his children. He is called the old man since he is true and gentle. What is lawful, he remembers and he knows just and gentle thoughts. Then he begot great Thavmus and proud Forkis, from union with Yea, and fair-cheeked Kitho, and Evrivia, who has in her breast a heart of adamant. To Neareths were born numerous divine children in the barren sea. Their mother was fair haired Dewey's, daughter of Okinos, the full circling river, Proto, Efgrandi, Sao, Amphitrite, Evdere, Betis, Galini, and Glafki, Kimothoi, Swift Spio, Lavithelia, Pasithea, Erato, and Rosamed of Niki, Graceful Maliti, Evlimini, Agavi, Dotu, Proto, Therissa, and Dinamini, Nise, Achaea, and Protomedia, Doris, and Panopi, and Shekli Galatia, Lovely Epothoi, Rosamed Ipnu, Kimoduki, who easily calms waves on the windy sea and the blowing of windy gales with Kimataligi and fine-ankled Amphitrite, and Kimo, Ioni, and well-crowned Elimidi, Glafkonomi, who love smiles, and Pontoporia, Leagore, and Ivogore, and Lermedia, Pulinoe, and Aftonoe, and Lysionassa, Evani of lovely shape and blameless form, Samothy of graceful body, Divine Minipi, Nizo, of Pumbi, the Misto, and Pronoe, and Nematis, who has the mind of her immortal father, these were the daughters of blameless Nereths, fifty girls, skilled in blameless works. Bavmus married deep flowing Achina's daughter Electra. She bore swift Eris and the fair-haired Arpeus, Aelo and Ocopete, who fly as the birds and gust the winds on swift wings, rushing high in the air. Ketho bore to Forkis the fair-cheeked hags, grey from birth, who are called a grey A by immortal gods and men who go on earth fine-robed Humphredu and saffron-robed Enio, 
and the Gorgons, who live beyond famous Okinawas, at the limit toward night, with a clear voice Despery Days, Steno, every Ali, and an unlucky Medusa. She was mortal, but they were immortal and, and edgeless, both of them. The dark-haired god lay with her in a soft meadow and flowers of spring. And when Perseps cut off her head, out jumped great Chrysler and the horse Pegasus, who has this name since by the springs of the Okinos he was born, and the other holds a gold sword in his hands. He flew off and left the earth, mother of flocks, and came to the immortals. He lives in the house of Wisefs and carries his thunder and lightning. Chrysler Oak begot three-headed Urianos, from union with Galero, daughter of famous Okinos. Mighty Erechiles kill Urianos by his rolling gated cattle in sea washed Erythia on the very day he drove the wide-faced cattle to Holy Tyrans, having crossed the ford of Okinos and killed Orthros and the herdsmen every Tion in the misty stable beyond famous Okinos. She bore another unbeatable monster, in no way like mortal men or immortal gods. In a hollow cave, the divine and hard-hearted echidna, half a nymphy with glancing eyes and lovely cheeks, half a monstrous snake, terrible and great, a shimmering flesh eater in the dark halls of holy earth. There she has a cave, down under the hollow rock, far from the immortal gods and mortal men, there the gods allotted to her a famous house to live in. Grimmy Kidna watches in Arima under the earth, an immortal and edgeless nymphy for all days, they say that Tifo-Fs was joined in love with her, the arrogant and lawless monster with the glancing girl. She conceived and bore strong-hearted children. First, she bore Orthros, the dog of Urionos. Next, she bore the unfightable and unspeakable flesh-eating gatherers, bronze-voiced dog of Ardis, fifty-headed, pitiless and strong. Third, she bore the ill-intended Idra of Laini, whom the white-armed goddess Ira raised in her infinite anchor against mighty Erechles. She died by the unfeeling bronze sword of Erechles, son of Seth and stepson of Amphitryon, with war-loving Eorus, by the plans of army-leading Athene. She bore Chimera, who breathes furious fire, terrible and great, swift-footed and strong, with three heads, one of a hard-eyed lion, one of a goat, one of a snake, a strong serpent, a lion in front, a snake behind, a goat in between, breathing the terrible strength of blazing fire. Pegasus and noble Velerophon killed her, and she bore the deadly Sphinx, destroyer of the Gadmezins, from union with Orthros, and the Nemea online, Umira, noble wife of Zephs, raised and settled in the hills of Nemea, a plague to men. There, he lived and ravaged the tribes of men, master of Nemea on Cretas and Pesos, but the great strength of the Heracles overcame him. Ketho joined in love with Forkis and bore her youngest, a terrible serpent in the recesses of Dark Earth, at the Great Limits, who guards the All Golden Apples. And this is the progeny from Ketho and Forkis. Tithis bore to Okinos the swirling rivers, Nilos, Alphiwars, and deep whirling Aridanos, Streamen, Maindras, and fair flowing Istros, Farsis, Rezes, and silver swirling Achilles. Nesson, Rodeos, Aeochon, Epteperos, Granigos, as opposed, and Divine Samoas, Peneos, Aemas, and Fair Flowing Degos, Great Sangarios, Ladin, and Parthenios, Avenos, Ardiscos, and Divine Scamandros. And she bore a holy race of Cori, who on earth raised youths to manhood, with Lord Apollon and the rivers, holding this duty from Zeus, Pitho, Admeti, the Anthe and the Electra, Doris, Primno, and Arania of divine form, Ipo, Clemene, Rodi, and Galero, Zetsa, Cletia, Edea, and Pasitoi, Plixivri, Galaxivri, and beautiful Dione, Meliversis, Thoi, and fair-figured Polydora, Greekies, beautiful of form, and cow-eyed Pluto, Percy, Eonira, Argaste, and Santi, lovely Petrae, Menestho, Ephormi, Metis, Evrenormi, and Saffron-robed Callisto, Chryseus, Asia, and Desirable Galopso, Evdori, Tiki, Amphiro, and Okuoi, and Styx, who is most eminent of all. These were born from Okinaws and Tithis, the eldest daughters, but there are also many others, 
for Orkinaws has 3,000 slender ankled daughters, ooh, scattered over the earth and watery depths, surf everywhere alike, glorious divine children. There are as many other rivers, noisily flowing, sons of Orkinaws, whom mistress Dith is bore. It is hard for a man to say the names of them all, but individuals know the ones by which they live. The are bore great ears, and bright Selene, and Eos, who shines upon all the earth, and upon the immortal gods who hold the wide sky, after the R was won in love by Perion. Divine of Rivia joined in love with Creos, and bore Astraeus, and great Pallas, and Perses, who stands out among all for his knowledge. To Astraeus, Eos bore the strong-hearted winds, cleansing Zephyrus, and swift-running Voreas, and Notus, a goddess united in love with a god. After these, Rhenia bore the star Aeosphorus, and the shining stars, the sky wears as a crown. Styx, daughter of Orkinos, lay with Pallas, and bore Zelus and fine ankled Nike in the house. And she bore famous children, Crates and Vie, whose house is not apart from Zeph's. They neither sit nor go, except where the god should lead them, but always are stationed by deep funding Zeph's. This is what immortal Styx, daughter of Orkinos, planned on that day when the Olympian lightning holder called all the immortal gods to vast Olympus and said whichever gods with him would fight the Titanes would not lose their rights, but each would have the honor he held before among the immortal gods. He said that whoever held no honor or right under Cronus would enter upon honor and rights, as is just. First, immortal Styx came to Olympus with her children, by the advice of her father. Zeph honored her and gave outstanding gifts. He set her to be the god's great oath and gave to her children to leave with him for all days. Just as he promised, to all without fail he fulfilled, as for himself, he rules with great power. Foivy came to Kyo's bed of much desire, the goddess, pregnant by the god's love, bore a dark-robed litho, always sweet and gentle to men and immortal gods sweet from the first, most mild in Olympus. She also bore remarkable Asteria, whom Perses led to his great house to be called his wife. She conceived and bore Agati, whom above all Zeph's, Cronos' son, honored. He gave her notable gifts, to have a share of the earth and barren sea. She also has a share of honor from the starry sky, and is honored most of all by the immortal gods. For even now, Whenever someone of men on it sacrifices fine things and prays in due ritual, he invokes Ligati. Much honor comes to him very easily, whose prayers the goddess favorably receives, and she grants him wealth, since this is her power. For as many were born of Yea and Uranos and obtained honor, among them all she has her due. Kronos' son neither wronged her nor took away what she received among the Titanes, the former gods, but this she keeps, as was the division at the beginning. Nor, since she is an only child, does the goddess obtain less honor and privileges on earth and sky than sea, but rather, she has still more, for Zeph's honors her. Greatly she assists and benefits whom she will. She sits by reverent kings in judgment, and he is eminent among the people in assembly, whom she wishes. Whenever men are for man killing war, then the goddess is there, and to whom she wishes, she gladly grants victory and extends glory. She is good to stand by cavalry, by whom she wishes. She is also good when men compete in the contest. Then also the goddess assists and benefits them. One who wins by might and strength, bears off the fine prize easily and happily, and brings glory to his parents. To those who work grey sees discomfort, and pray to a Agati and loud-sounding earth shake, the noble goddess easily grants much catch, and easily takes it back when it appears, if her heart wishes. She is good, with a means, to increase the stock in barns, herds of cattle and wide herds of goats and flocks of woolly sheep, if her spirit wishes. She increases from few and from many makes less. So, even though being her mother's only child, she is honored with privileges among all the immortals. Kronos' son made her guardian of the young, who after her saw with their eyes the light of much seeing hills. So always she guards the young, and these are her honors. Rhea lay with Cronus and bore illustrious children, Estia, Demeteta, and gold-sandaled Era, and strong Ardis, 
who lives in a palace under the ground and has a pitiless heart, and loud sounding earth shaker and wiseps, the father of gods and men, by whose thunder the wide earth is shaken. Great Kronos would swallow these, as each would come from the holy womb to his mother's knees, intending this, that none of Urano's proud line but himself would hold the right of king over the immortals. For he learned from Yea and starry Urenos that it was fate that his own son would overthrow him, although he was powerful by the plans of great Zephs. So he kept no blind man's watch, but alertly swallowed his own children. Incurable grief held Rhea. But when she was about to bear Zephs, father of gods and men, she begged her own dear parents, Yea and starry Urenos, to help her think of a plan by which she might secretly have her son and make great crafty Kronos pay the Arrhenias of her father and the children he swallowed. They heard and obeyed their dear daughter, and told her what was destined to happen, concerning King Kronos and his strong-hearted son. They sent her to Lictus, to the rich land of Crete, when she was about to bear her youngest son, Great Zeps. Vast Yea received him from her in wide Crete to tend and raise. Carrying him through the swift black night, she came first to Lictus, Taking him in her arms, she hid him in a deep cave down in dark halls of holy earth, on Mount Aegeon, dense with woods. Rhea wrapped a huge stone in a baby's robe, and fed it to Urano's wide ruling son, king of the earlier gods. He took it in his hands and put it down his belly, the fool. He did not think in his mind that instead of a stone, his own son, undefeated and secure, was left behind soon to overthrow him by force and violence and drive him from his honor and rule the immortals himself. Swiftly then, the strength and noble limbs of the future lord grew. At the end of a year, tricked by the clever advice of Yea, great crafty Kronos threw up his children, defeated by the craft and force of his own son. First, he vomited out the stone he had swallowed last. Zeph fixed it firmly in the wide parted out at sacred pitha in the veils of Parnassus to be a sign thereafter, a wonder to mortal men. He released from their deadly chains, his uncles, Urenos' sons, whom their father mindlessly bound. They did not forget gratitude for his help, and gave him thunder and the fiery lightning bolt and lightning, which Vastia earlier had hidden. Relaying on these, he is king of mortals and immortals. The Arpiters married the fine ankled daughter of Okinus, Klimene, and went up to the same bed, she bore him a son, strong-hearted Atlas, and she bore all eminent many Teos, and Prometheus, subtle and devious, and wrong-thinking Epimetheus, who was from the first an evil for men who work for food. He first received from Zeps, the molded woman, the virgin. Wide-seeing Zeps sent arrogant many Teos down to Bay Rivers, striking him with a smoking thunderbolt for his recklessness and excessive pride. And Atlas, standing at the limits of the art, before the clear voice desperate days, under strong compulsion, holds the wide sky with head and untiring arms, for this is the fate why Zephs allotted him. He bound devious Prometheus with inescapable harsh bonds, fastened through the middle of a column, and he inflicted on him a long-winged eagle, which ate his immortal liver, but it grew as much in all at night as the long-winged bird would eat all day. Heracles, the mighty son of fine-ankled Orpini, killed it and freed from evil suffering the son of Eopatos, and released him from anguish by the will of high ruling Olympian Zeps, so that the glory of Theovigian born Heracles would be more than before on the nurturing hurt. Thinking of this, he honored his famous son, and though he was angry with the rage he had ever since the Titan matched wits with Chrono's mighty son. For when gods and mortal men made a settlement at Magoni, then he cleverly cut up a big ox and set it before them, trying to deceive the mind of Zeps. For Zephs, he set out meat and innards rich with fat on the skin, covering it with the stomach of the ox. But for men, he set the white ox bones, with crafty skill, arranging them well and covering them with shining fat. Then the father of men and God said to him, Son of the Arbitos, distinguished of all gods, sir, how unjustly you divided the portions. Thus Zephs, knowing deathless plan, spoke and mocked him. But clever Prometheus answered him, gently smiling, and did not forget his crafty trick. Zeps, most honored and greatest of eternal gods, take of these, whichever the spirit within tells you. 
He spoke with the trick in mind, but Zeph's knowing deathless plans, knew and did not miss the trick. In his heart, he foresaw evils which were going to happen to mortal men. With both hands, he lifted up the white fat. But he was angry in mind, and rage came to his spirit, when he saw the white axe bones in the crafty trick. Therefore, the tribes of men on earth burned to the immortals, white bones on reeking altars. Greatly angry, Cloud Gatherer Zeph said to him, Son of the Arbiters, knowing thoughts beyond all, sir, you still have not forgotten your crafty trick. So spoke angry Zephs, who knows deathless plans. From then on, never forgetting the trick, he would not give the strength of untiring fire to ash trees for mortal men who live on the earth. But the great son of the Arbiters deceived him and stole the far seen light of untiring fire in a hollow Nothix. This bit deep in the spirit of high thundering Zephs and his heart was angry when he saw the far-seen light of fire among men. In return for fire, he quickly made an evil foreman, for the famous lame one made from out the likeness of the modest virgin, by the plans of Chrono's son. Altlaid Ophini sashed her and dressed her in silver clothes. She placed with her hands a decorated veil on her head, marvelous to see, and lovely fresh garlands, the flowers of plants, palace Ophini put around her head, and she placed on her head a golden crown which the famous lame one had made himself, shaping it with his hands to please Father Zeps. On it he carved many designs, a marvelous sight. Of all red beasts the land and sea nourish, he included most, amazingly similar to living animals with voices, and beauty breathed over all. But when he made the levy evil to pay for the good, he led her where the other gods and men were. She delighted in the finery from the great father's old lay daughter, all filled immortal guards and mortal men when they saw the sheer trick, irresistible to men. <laughs> For from her is the race of female women, from her is the deadly race and tribes of women, a great plague to mortals, dwelling with men, not suited for cursed poverty, but for wealth. As when bees in covered hypes feed the drones, companions of evil works, the bees work until sunset, all day and every day, and make the pale comes, while the drones stay inside, in the covered hives, reaping the work of others into their own stomachs. Similarly for mortal men, high thunder and Zephs made an evil. Women, the partners of evil works. He gave a second evil to balance a good, since whoever escapes marriage and women's harm by refusing to marry, comes to deadly old age with no son to tend him, not lacking livelihood while he lives. When he dies, distant can divide his estate. But even the man whose fate is to marry and acquires a good wife, suited to his wants, for him from the first, good and evil are balanced always, but whoever acquires the wicked sort, leaves with unending trouble in his mind, spirit and heart, and the evil is incurable. So it is impossible to cheat or surpass the mind of Zeph's. For not even Eopatus' son, good Prometheus, escaped his heavy anchor, but of necessity great bondage holds him, though he knows many things. When first the father was angry at heart with Ovriorios and Cotos and years, he bound them in strong bondage. When he noticed their great manhood, their looks and size, he put them under the white parted earth. They lived there under the earth in pain, at the farthest borders of the great earth, suffering much and long, with great grief of heart. But Chrono's son and the other immortal gods, whom fair-haired Rhea bore from Chrono's embrace, brought them up to the light by years counsel. For she told them everything in detail, how with their help they would win victory and bright fame. For all time they fought in bitter exertion against one another in harsh battles. The Teton gods and those born of Cronus, the bred Tetoness from lofty Ophrys and from Olympus, the gods, givers of good, whom fair Hebrea bore, having lain with Cronus. With bitter war against one another, they fought continually for ten full years. There was no end or relief from harsh strife or either. The war's outcome was evenly balanced. But when he gave them everything fitting, nectar and ambrosia, which the gods eat themselves, and the proud spirit grew in the breast of all, when they tested nectar and desirable ambrosia, then the father of gods and men said to them, Hear me, the children of Yea and Uranus, that I may say what the spirit in my chest commands. For a long time now against one another, we have fought every day for victory and power. The Teton gods and we born of Cronus. Show your great strength and unbeatable arms against the Teton is in savage war. 
Remember our kindness, and how much you suffered before you came to the light from grievous bondage under the murky gloom, thanks to our plans. When he had spoken, Blameless Cartus replied, Divine One, who tells what we know, on our own, we knew your superior mind and thoughts, and that you defended the immortals from icy harm. By your counsels, we came back from the murky gloom, back from the unyielding bonds, obtaining the unexpected, Lord Son of Cronus. So now, with firm mind and willing spirit, we will defend your power in hostile war, fighting the Titanus in harsh battles. After he spoke, the gods who give good welcomed the words they heard. Their spirit longed for war even more than before, and they roused from conflict that same day, all of them, female as well as male. The Titan gods against those born of Cronus, and those Zephs brought to light from darkness under the earth, dread and strong, with huge might. A hundred arms shot from the shoulders of each and all, fifty heads grew from the shoulders of each, from their massive bodies. They stood against the Titanus in grim battle, holding great rocks in their massive hands. The Titanus opposite strengthened their ranks expectantly. Both displayed the work of arms and might together, and the vast sea echoed loudly and the art resounded greatly, and the wide sky shook and groaned, and great Oenpose was shaken from its foundation by the Immortal's charge. A heavy tremor of feet reached in Tartarus, and the loud noise of unspeakable rout and violent weapons. So they hurled at each other the painful weapons. Shouts from both sides reached scary Uranus, as they came together with a great outcry. Zets no longer restrained his might, but now his heart was filled with wrath, and he revealed all his strength from the sky and Uncle's bow. He came throwing a lightning flare. The bolts flew fit with thunder and lightning from his massive hand, whirling a holy flame, one after another. The life-giving earth resounded in flames. The vast woods crackled loudly about. The whole earth and the more streams and the barren sea were boiling. The hot blast enveloped the phonic tetanus. The flame reached the upper air in its fury. Although they were strong, the blazing glow of thunder and lightning blinded their eyes. The awful heat seized hoppers, it seemed, for eyes to see and ears to hear the sound. Just as if but and white sky from above came together. For so great a noise would arise from the one falling upon and the other falling down. Such a noise arose from the strife of clashing guards. The wind stirred up earthquake and dust and thunder and lighting and blazing lightning bolt, the weapon of great zeps, and brought the shout and cry into the midst of both sides. A great din arose from fearful strife, and might's work was revealed. But the tide of battle turned. Before, in mutual collision, they fought continuously in grim battles. But now in the front ranks, they roused dread war. Carters and free Areos and years, hungry for war. They threw three hundred rocks from massive hands at once, and with their missiles overshadowed the Titanus. They sent them under the white carted earth, and bound them in cruel bonds. Having defeated them by force, despite their daring, as far below the earth as sky is above the earth, for it is that far from the earth to dim Tartarus. A bronze anvil falling for nine nights and days from the sky would reach the earth on the tenth, and a bronze anvil falling for nine nights and days from the earth would reach Tartarus on the tenth. Around it runs a bronze fence, and about its neck flows night in a triple row, while above grow the roots of earth and the barren sea. There, the Titan gods under the dim gloom are hid away by the plans of cloud gatherer Zephs, in a moldy place, the limits of vast earth. For them is no escape, since Poseidon put in bronze doors, and the fence runs on both sides. There, yes, Cotters, and great spirited Ovria Rios leave the faithful guards of Zephs Aegeocos. There, Dockert, and Dim Tartaros, and the Barren Sea, and Starry Sky, all have their sources and limits in a row, terrible and dank, which even the gods abhor. The chasm is great, and not until a year's end would a man reach the bottom. If first he were within the doors, but terrible gust after gust would carry him here and there. It is awful even for the immortal gods. This is monstrous, and the terrible house of Dimnik stands covered in dark clouds. In front, the son of Eopatos holds the wide sky with his head and untiring arms, standing immobile, where Nyx and Amera come near and address one another, passing the great threshold of bronze. One will go down in, 
the other comes from the door, and the house never holds both within, but always one is out of the house and traverses the earth, while the other is in the house and awaits the time of her journey, when it will come, one holds much seeing light for those on earth, the other, who holds in her arms, Ignos, brother of Thanatos, is deadly Nyx, covered in misty cloud. There, the children of Dark Nyx have their homes, Ignos and Thanatos, awful guards, Never does shining ears look on them with his beams, as he goes up to the sky or comes down from the sky. The former crosses the earth and wide backs of the sea, harmless and gentle to men, but the other's heart is iron, and his bronze heart is pitiless in his chest. He holds whomever he once seizes at men, he is hateful even to the immortal gods. There, in front the echoing homes of the nether god stained, of mighty Ardis and awesome Persephone, and a terrible dog is on guard in front, unpitying possessor of an evil trick. On those going in, he phones with his tail and both ears, but does not let them go back out, and waiting, eats whomever he catches going out the doors, of mighty Ardis and awesome Persephone. There dwells a goddess hated by the immortals, terrible sticks, as his daughter of backflowing Aginos. Away from the guards she lives in a noble house, roofed with great rocks, on all sides, it reached up to the sky with silver pillars. Rarely does Iris, swift-footed daughter of Favmus, come as messenger over the sea's wide backs. Whenever conflict and strife arise among the immortals, and one of those who have Olympian homes should lie, Zeth sends Iris to bring the god's great oath from afar in a golden pitcher, the famous cold water which trickles down from a high steep rock. Far below the wide parted earth, it flows from the holy river through black night. A branch of Okinawa's. A tenth part is allotted to it. Nine parts, winding around the earth and sees white backs and silver eddies fall into the sea. But the tenth flows out from the rock, a great vault to the guards. Whoever pours libation and breaks his oath of the immortals who hold the peaks of snowy Olympus, lies and breathing until the year's end. He never comes near ambrosia and nectar for food, but lies and breathing and on speaking on a covered bed, and an evil coma covers him. But when he ends being sick for a great year, another harsh ordeal succeeds the first. For nine years he is parted from the gods who always are, and never joins in council and feasts, for nine full years. In the tenth, he rejoins the meetings of the immortals who have Olympian homes. The gods made the eternal and primal water of Styx such an oath. It emerges through a forbidding place. There, Dark Earth, and Din Tartarus, and the barren sea, and starry sky. I'll have their sources and limits in a rule, terrible and dank, which even the gods abhor. There are shining gates, and a bronze threshold with never-ending ropes, unmovable and natural, beyond and far from all the gods. Leave the Titanes, past gloomy carbos. But the famous helpers of Lad Thunder and Zeps, leave in houses on Okinaw's foundations, Carters and Yes. But the deep-roaring Earth Shaker made free Areos his son-in-law for his courage and gave him his daughter Kimopolia to marry. But when Zeph drove the Titanus from the sky, Bastia bore her young kissed child Kifoix from the love of Tartarus, through golden Aphrodite, his hands are strong to do his work, and the mighty god's legs never tire. From his shoulders grew a hundred snake heads, a dread serpents with dark and lambent arms. His eyes under the brows on the awesome heads shot fire. From all the heads, fire blazed as he glowered, from all the dread heads came voice which spoke all unspeakable sounds. At one time, they made sounds the gods understand. At another, the sound of a proud bellowing boom, unstoppable in wrath. At another, a lion with ruthless spirit. Again, sounds like a pack of dogs, marvelous to hear. Again, he would hiss and high mountains re echoed. Nothing past help would have happened that day, and he would have ruled over immortals and mortals if the king of men and gods had not got quickly. He thundered hard and strong, and all the earth resounded horribly, and the white sky above and sea and oak in north streams and earth's lowest parts. Great Opus trembled under the immortal feet of the Lord setting out, and the earth groaned. Heat from both of them seized the violent sea, from thunder and lightning, from the monstrous fire, from searing winds, and from the fiery lightning bolt. The whole earth was boiling, and the sky and sea, great waves raged around and over the coast from the immortals' attack, and endless rumbling rose. 
Argus, Lord of the Dead Below, trembled, and so did the Titans around Krennus and Tartarus, from the endless noise and awful war. When the Anchor of Zeph's reached its height, he seized his weapons, thunder and lightning and lightning bolt, leaped from Olympus, and struck. He burned all the dread monsters' unspeakable heads. When he had whipped him and broken him with blows, he threw him down, crippled, and great Yaya groaned. Fire poured from the thunderstruck lord in the dark rocked glens of the mountain where he was hit, and the vast earth burned widely from unspeakable heat and melted, as tin is melted in well-bored crucibles by workman's skill, or as iron, hardest of all things, is melted by burning fire and mountain glens in the holy earth, by the arts of Aphistos. So, the earth melted in the glare of blazing fire, and Zeps, vexed in spirit, threw him into wide Tartarus. From T4Fs is the strength of wet blowing winds, except Notus and Voreus and clearing Zephyrus, these are a sort from the gods, a great help to mortals. But the other winds blow force on the sea, some fall upon the misty sea, a great plague to mortals, and they rage with evil storm. They blow unpredictably, scattering ships and killing sailors. There is no defense against their harm for men who meet them on the sea. And other winds on the vast flowering earth destroy the beautiful fields of earthborn men, filling them with dust and terrible tumult. But when the blessed gods had finished their work, and decided the matter of rights with the Titanists by force, they urged wide-seeing Olympian Zephs to be king and rule the immortals, by Yair's advice. And he divided their honors among them. Zephs, king of gods, made Metis his first wife, she who knows most of gods and mortal men. But when she was about to bear the old light goddess Ophine, then he deceived her mind with a trick of widely words, and put her down in his belly, by the advice of Yea and Starry Uranus. Thus they advised him, so that no other of the eternal gods would hold the office of king but Zephs. For from her wise children were fated to be born. First, a daughter, Old Light Tritigenia, like her father in strength and wise counsel. But then she was going to bear a son proud of heart, king of gods and men. But first, Zephs put her into his own belly, so the goddess might advise him on good and evil. Second, he married Sleek Famous, who bore the Ore of Nomia and Diki and Blooming Irene, who tend the works of mortal men, and the Mire, to whom Wyseps gave most honor, Clotho and Lachesis and Artropos, who give mortal men to have both good and evil. Evrenorme, Okinor's daughter of fairest form, bore to him the three fair cheeked Karates, Aglaia, Ephrosini, and lovely Thalia. Limb loosening desire poured from their glancing eyes. Beautifully, they glanced under their brows. Next, he came to the bed of nurturant Demeter. She bore white armed Persephone, who made Jonas seized from her mother, but Zephs allowed it. Then, he left fair haired Mani Mosine, who bore the nine muses with golden headbands, whose delight is banquets and the pleasure of song. And Litho, joined in love to Zephs' Ajok hose, Bore Apollon and Archerus Artemis, beautiful children beyond all of Uranus' descendants. Lastly, he made Ira his blooming wife. She bore Evie and Aris and Elithia, having joined in love with the king of gods and men. He himself bore from his head Othlydothene, the awesome, fight routsing, army leading, unwary mistress whose delight is din and wars and battles. But Ira, who was angry and at arts with her husband, without love's union, bore famous Aphistos, excellent in arts beyond all of Uranus' descendants. From Amphitrite and loud-sounding Earthshaker, was born great and mighty Triton, who in the sea's depth, leaves with his mother and lord father and golden homes, an awful god. But to Aris, piercer of shields, Keitherea, bore Fovis and Deimos, Terrible ones who wrapped the dense ranks of men in cold war with city destroying Aris. And she bore Armonia, whom high spirited Godmos took as his wife. And the Atlantic mayor bore to Zeph's glorious Hermes, herald of the gods, after going up to his holy bed. And the Gadmese Mele bore an illustrious son, much cheering Dionysus, after joining Zeph's in love, mortal with immortal. Now they both are gods. 
and Orbini bore a mighty Erecles, having joined it left with cloud gathering Zeps. And Ephistos, the famous lame god, made Aglaia, youngest of the Carates, his blooming wife. And gold haired Dionysus took up an Ariadne, daughter of Aminas, as his blooming wife. Cronos' son made her immortal and, and ageless for him. The strong son of fair ankled Orbini, mighty Erecles, having finished his painful labors, took Evie, child of great Zephs and gold sandaled Era as his modest wife in snowy Olympus, he is happy, who finished his great work and leaves with the immortals, carefree and ageless for all days. To untiring Elas, the famed Okinidas person, bore Kilki and the king Aetis. Aetis, son of Elas who shines on mortals, by the gods' plans married fair-cheeked Egea, the daughter of the perfect river Okinos, she bore to him fine-ankled Medea, conquered in the thanks to golden Aphrodite. Farewell now, you who have Olympian homes, U.S. lands, mainland, and salty sea within. Now, sweet-voiced Olympian muses, daughters of Zephs Aegeokos, sing the band goddesses, immortals who went to bed with mortal men, and bore children similar to gods. The divine goddess Demeter, joined in dear love with the hero Eeslon in a thrice plowed field, in the rich land of Crete, bore kindly Plutus, who goes over the whole earth and the sea's wide backs, who meets him and takes him in his arms, the god makes rich and grants him much prosperity. Armonia, daughter of golden Aphrodite, to god most bore Eno and Semele and fair-cheeked Agave and Aftonoi, who long-haired Riste is married, and Pluteros in well-crowned Thieve. Galero, Okinaw's daughter, Joined in golden Aphrodite's love to strong-hearted Chrysippo, bore a son, the strongest of all mortals, Yerionos, who mighty Erecles killed in sea swept Erythia for his rolling gated cattle. And he was bore to Tithonos bronze-crested Menon, king of the Ethiopia, and the lord of Mathion. And to Gaphilos she bore a glorious son, valiant for Ethan, a man like the gods, when he was young, in the delicate flower of famous youth. A child of tender thoughts, laughter-loving Aphrodite snatched him up, and took, and made him innermost keeper of her holy temples, a godlike daemon. Aeson's son, by the plans of the eternal gods, took from Aetis, God-raised king, his daughter, having finished the many painful labors which the great and arrogant king assigned, Peleus, violent and impetuous still of Rome, having finished these, Aeson's son came to the augurs after much labor, bringing the glancing girl on the swift ship, and made her his fresh bride. Tamed by Eorzen, shepherd of the people, she bore a son Midias, whom Fiora's son, Kieran, raised in the mountains. Great Seth's will was done. As for the daughters of Nereus, old man of the sea, the divide goddess Psamathi bore focus from the love of the Acres, thanks to golden Aphrodite, and the silver shot goddess Thetis, tamed by Pelops, bore up Helops, the lion-spirited manslayer. And well crowned Kitheria bore Aeneas, having joined in dear love with the hero Anhesis on the peaks of Windy Edie with many glens. And Kilki, daughter of the Aperinidias, in the love of patient-minded Odysseus, bore Agrios and Latinos, blameless and strong, and she bore Talegonos, thanks to golden Aphrodite. Far away in a niche of holy Icelands, they ruled over all the famous Disneys. The divine goddess Galopso, joined to Odysseus in dear love, bore Nafsidos and Nafsinos. These are the immortals who went to bed with mortal men and bore children similar to gods. Now, sweet-voiced Olympian muses, daughters of Zephs Aegeokos, sing of the race of women.